So I'm Vishal. Uh, I'm a self-employed uh, independent data science consultant. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about myself, so you can check out my website uh, if you are interested in um, what I do. Uh, I live in Richmond, Virginia. Um, and I've been doing uh, data mining for about a decade and a half now. So a quick agenda of what we are going to talk about today. Uh, the first five to ten minutes, five to seven minutes, we're going to talk about uh, what is dimensionality reduction, uh, when should we use it, and why should uh, data scientists uh, use dimensionality reduction techniques. Right. So, uh, and then the majority of the talk is about how to do it. Um, this is the, the emphasis of this talk is on practicality of things. Right. So I'll not try to get into too much the theory, but uh, we'll talk more about the practical. Uh, way to do this uh, dimensionality reduction techniques. Um, I have some Python code as well, uh, which you guys can probably review after the talk. Uh, the video will be up on the website. Uh, we won't have too much time to go through the code line by line, but I'll give you a brief um, idea of what, uh, what goes on in those uh, snippets of code. And then finally, five to ten minutes, we'll, uh, I'll be happy to answer questions. So please hold off your questions until the end. Uh, so first question is, what is dimensionality or uh, feature reduction technique, right? What is it? So it is basically a process of selecting a subset of features uh, to be used in the model, right? So, so it belongs to the pre-processing of data uh, step in your data science um, project. Uh, so before you actually start using or start testing different machine learning techniques, uh, if you have thousands and thousands of variables in your data set, then it makes sense to try to reduce dimensionality and then reduce the number of variables that you have in your data set to a manageable, uh, reasonable number before you actually try machine learning techniques and see which model actually is best for your data. Uh, it can be useful for both supervised and unsupervised techniques, uh, but for this talk, we're going to focus on supervised classification problem. Uh, I will actually uh, talk briefly about the unsupervised, um, how it can be useful for unsupervised as well. But most of the stuff is about supervised classification problem. Uh, so just a quick question for you guys, actually. How many of you are data scientists? OK, cool. Uh, about a quarter. Um, <clears throat> thank you. So um, the, the, really, the dimensionality reduction technique, this whole um, process, belongs to uh, kind of the art aspect of data science. right? Data science is very widely uh, very, very common, uh, commonly used term nowadays. Uh, and it's easy to use the term without realizing often that there's a lot of art involved with, with data science, right? So a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about here uh, really belongs to that, um, that aspect of data science. Um, there is some recipe, so to speak, for sure. But a lot of times when you have different data sets, different industry, uh, different business problem, you will have to improvise. You will have to use different rules of thumb. Um, and you have to kind of um, adapt based on your data set, right? So when, I think I briefly already talked about when we would use dimensionality reduction techniques. So this is, uh, you might have seen this kind of flowchart um, of the whole uh, class supervised learning problem. A different version of this might be. Um, but usually some, everything starts with like a business problem or, or some kind of problem, right? Then you start looking at the data, you uh, create variables, you create that tabular format vectorized data set, and then you, uh, it's kind of tempting to go directly from a vectorized data directly to modeling, right? Um, so I've seen that happen a lot of times, right? But, but it is not the best way to do it, right? Um, you would actually, you want to spend a lot of time uh, imputing, transforming, and preparing your data for model, actually, right? And there are, def uh, Definitely a um, lot of advantages of doing that, and we'll talk about that. Um, so this is where the dimensionality reduction techniques are going to fall under. There are um, many techniques that, are, that, be, that, that you should use before you actually build your model. But there are some other techniques that, that are actually embedded with the machine learning algorithm itself, themselves. So we'll, we'll talk about those as well. So the data I'm going to use for this talk is uh, it's come from one of the Kaggle challenges, um, Springleaf data. I know some of you might be familiar with that. 
uh, there, are, there were 1,933 variables and 145,000 uh, records. So the goal was to use those features to predict which customers are likely to buy, respond to a marketing offer, right? Uh, so the challenge was really twofold. Um, you were supposed to create new features using the already uh, existing like large number of features, 1,933. You were supposed to create new features and you were supposed to employ uh, feature selection methods to actually identify the best model, right? Um, so the first part of the challenge, to construct uh, new meta variables, so I have actually done that, and that's actually, I'm not gonna talk about how I created new variables. Um, that's probably a kind of a different talk, right? How to create new variables, how to create features and stuff. Uh, what we're gonna focus on is obviously the feature selection methods. So as I said earlier, right, why not just this? Um, using scikit line, you have a logistic regression package. You can read the data in pandas using one line, and you can just throw the whole data set into uh, 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 a model, right? You would have a, uh, you could argue that you could have a reasonable model using just this technique, like kitchen sink approach, right? You may end up with a, you may have an area under the curve which is more than 0.5, uh, so you are still doing better than a coin toss, right? But uh, but there's a better way to do that. Um, so why would you not want to do that? Because, um, so there are several reasons, right? So the true dimensionality in your data is usually uh, very, very small uh, than the observed dimensionality, right? So especially in the age of big data that we all live in, there are so many features available about customer, about persons, about individuals, products, uh, so when you're trying to solve a specific business problem, uh, not all of those things are going to be important for that prediction, right? It's going to be a smaller set of variables that's going to be um, useful. Curse of dimensionality is another factor to keep in mind, right? So for a given number of observations, if you increase the number of variables, then your accuracy is going to suffer, right? Um, because you can have more permutations and more variables in your data, in your, in your model. Uh, it also matters what value you are trying to provide using your analytics, using your, your, your model, right? Are you only trying to come up with the best predictive, mathematically accurate model that you can using your data? Or are you also trying to provide some kind of explanation, right? Um, now this is usually very applicable. I, I, I do a lot of data science uh, modeling for marketing uh, in the marketing industry. So it's not just about predicting, it's not about just building the best model that you can you actually have to come up with some kind of explanation uh, which variables are driving your, your prediction, right? which variables are important. Uh, law of parsimony is another one, right? If you can build a pretty strong model uh, using 15 variables, then why include all 1,500, right? So the simpler explanations are generally better, set as variables. Uh, overfitting is an issue, so if you're not being careful with cross-validation, um, then with so many variables, it's very easy to um, overfit your model. And execution time is important as well, right? So if you build a model with thousands of variables and you may have a very strong model, but when you actually productionalize it, when it goes into um, deployment, it would have to create those, the, the, the process have to create those 1,500 variables every time you score the model, right? So it's gonna it's gonna take a toll on on the processing time. So those are the factors, right? You want to keep in mind. Those are actually uh, reasons why dimensionality reduction techniques are actually useful. Um, it, it's not it's not necessarily accuracy of the model, right? It's actually um, many other things, right? That we talked about on, on the previous slide. So these are the twelve techniques that I will talk about. We'll spend probably uh, two and a, two two and a half minutes on each one. Um, in general, they can be categorized into um, like four or five categories, right? Initially, we'll start with some very simple techniques that actually evaluates each variable on itself, in and off by itself, uh, and see how much information those variables are bringing. Then we'll start looking at pairs of variables and see if the variables are redundant, some of the variables are redundant. Um, Predictive power is another another thing we'll look at, right? How, how predictive they are, how much correlation they have with the target that you are trying to model. Uh, there, then there are some greedy selection techniques, uh, the forward step, uh, forward selection, backward elimination, and stepwise. 
and then finally there are embedded methods, uh, the last two. So the first one is pretty straightforward, right? Percentage missing values. So you would look at how many, how, how often each variable is missing in your data, right? So some, some variables might be missing 50% of the time, other might, others might be 90% of the time. So when you have thousands of thousands of variables, you can actually afford to drop some variables potentially, right? If, you, if the variables are missing most often. Um, I, I always, almost always recommend creating binary indicators as well, right? So th they are um, often come out to be very predictive actually in these models uh, because missing actually does have some meaning often, right? If a, if a for telecom industry, for example, where, where I have worked um, a lot, uh, missing can probably mean that they don't have that feature, right? If you're missing data or missing WhatsApp users or something, they just don't have that app or they just don't have that feature. Um, so missing does have meaning and the, the missing value indicators can be often very useful. And, and review or visualize variables, right? So I don't recommend dropping stuff without looking at them. Uh, usually you want to try to inspect those variables closely and see what makes sense. Um, so this is a distribution. There are more than 5,000 variables now because I created so many. Um, but you can see that there are about 1,000 or so variables that have some missing values, right? There are some variables here at the top uh, that are missing uh, very often. So some of the rules of thumb that I used, um, now, now these are really kind of guidelines, right? So you, don't, you, know, you want to make decisions based on whatever distribution you have for your data set. But if the variable is more than 95% time missing, then it may make sense to drop them. Uh, you could actually make sure that, that those variables, uh, even if they are populated only 5% of the time, you can actually check their correlation with the target to make sure that you don't drop any, any uh, useful meaningful variables. If so, then you would try to do some kind of, um, I mean, imputation doesn't make sense in that case because they are missing 90% of the time, but you could try some interactions or something, right? Um, if the variable is missing more than 50% of the time, then it may not make sense to impute them with something else, right? Um, less than 50%, it may make sense to impute them. Um, but anyway, so, so that's the general idea, right? And, and any, any missing values, uh, any variable that has missing values, I would create binary flags and then check their correlation with the target to see which one actually I want to keep. Uh, it's very easy to do in, in Python uh, using pandas if you have x is your data matrix, then you can just do x dot describe to get the non-missing count. Um, and then you can calculate the person that's missing. The second one is simple as well, uh, amount of variation, right? So how, 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 how much variation those variables have in the data? Uh, if the variables don't vary much, then they may not have a lot of uh, information in them. So it may make sense to drop them. Uh, if you have your data standardized, then you can look at the variance. But if not, then first you want to but then you can just uh, use uh, look at the standard deviation. So there are about 500 variables in this data data set where the standard deviation was less than one. Um, so the, I mean sometimes you you would see a curve like this, right? Like something like this, where it's easy to see that some variables um, don't vary much. So you would actually get rid of the tail, right? Because they don't vary much. But in this case, it's kind of a linear trend. So there's no elbow really in this curve. Uh, definitely there are 39 variables that have zero variation, so you want to drop them. They're not going to add anything to the model. So now let's start looking at the pairwise correlations, right? Pair, pairs of variables. So you would evaluate each and every pairs of variables in your data. Uh, you would look at the correlation coefficient, coefficients uh, among them, between them, and you would drop one variable, right? If they are heavily correlated, then it makes sense to keep one and drop the other. So which variable you want to keep? Uh, the one that has a higher correlation with the target, right? So that's how you can break those pairs. Uh, so, so now we kind of start getting into the multicollinearity aspect, but just we are evaluating the bivariate um, correlation coefficients, the pairwise. So this is an example of a correlation. This is an illustrative example, actually. So um, absolute correlation coefficients are sh shown here. Uh, that's the first step. Um, then you identify variables that are pairs of variables that are heavily correlated. So you would uh, come up with some kind of tolerance, um, and you can play around with that a little bit, right? So I, this, this is what I use normally. Uh, so in this case, x1 and x3 are heavily correlated. Then you look at their correlation with the target, 
and the variable that has a higher correlation with the target wins. The other one can, can be dropped, right? So, um, so this is how I'm doing it in Python. Um, there's a lot of code here, um, but I'll just briefly, so basically the idea is this, right? So when you evaluate a correlation matrix, what I do is I go column by column in the correlation matrix, identify the pairs that are heavily correlated, then um, then look at the, 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 the correlation with Y, and in this case, X3 actually is something I want to drop. So I would drop that column, drop that row, and then reiterate through the correlation matrix. So you don't have to actually browse iterate through your entire data set. You'll just actually work from the correlation matrix. Uh, so it, it can work very, very fast. Uh, so that's what I'm doing here. In order to do the drop the rows, I'm using a mask array. Uh, NP stands for NumPy. So delete the row um, at the bottom and delete the column if the variable does not have a higher correlation with the target, right? Yes. Linear relationships? Non-linear. Non-linear. Um, because correlations are linear. Linear, right, yep. Um, so what are you you're concerned about, the correlation with Y, or just between axes? Um, well, I mean, between axes, which maybe could There could be, yeah. So there could be non-linear uh, multicollinearity in the data. Um, I actually don't know a way to identify that. Uh, one of the things I do um, is um, I actually transform the variables in a nonlinear fashion using decision tree, right? So, so you have something like income, for example, right? So I would, I would um, build a decision tree based on that one variable and create, let's say, five uh, leaf nodes, right? So you would have a range of income within each one of those. And then each, each one of the leaf nodes will have some event rate, right? So you could actually replace the income variable with a new variable that actually takes on the event rate within that. So that way, if there is a nonlinear relationship in income, you can actually capture that. So then after you transform the variable that way, you can actually do a logistic regression on lasso or something, which is linear, but actually you have the nonlinearity inbuilt into that. Um, so you could, you could definitely extend some of the ideas here to nonlinearity. So then uh, multicollinearity, right? Uh, so what if two or more variables are highly correlated with, uh, with each other? So there you can use something called condition index, uh, which is just a, another way to look at the eigenvalues, right? So the idea is to, again, look at the correlation matrix, and you would do eigenvalue decomposition of the correlation matrix, and you would get eigenvalues, right? Those are the eigenvectors, actually. You've got four eigenvectors in this case. So if the condition index is um, greater than 30, then you want to look at that eigenvector, right? This is uh, from, from textbook, actually. Um, and then you would look at the factor loading for each variable on that vector, right? So whichever variable has highest loading, um, that variable actually can be dropped because it is actually con contributing to multicollinearity. So in this case, basically, x1, x2, and x3 are correlated with each other. But what I would do is I would drop the one variable that has the highest loading and then I would reiterate. Because after dropping one variable, you may actually eliminate that multicollinearity problem, right? That is existing between those three variables. Um, so, um, so the way I do it, so this is the code, and again, um, we don't have a lot of time to go through this, but uh, I'm using NP, uh, NumPy, for uh, eigenvalue decomposition. And this is my condition index, right? If it's already less than 30, then I break. Um, I also want to control for minimum variables to keep, right? So if I, I don't want to keep going until like I end up with like 30 variables or something, right? So I, I'm trying to control for that in this loop as well. And then the idea is same, basically. Delete that row and column in the correlation matrix and reiterate, right? So before you have, before you actually take care of multicollinearity, your correlation matrix heat map might look like this, where a lot of the variables have very high correlations, right? plus one or negative one. Um, but after doing multicollinearity, now you will still have some multicollinearity in the data because it's, it's not, it's not uh, possible using this technique to eliminate it completely. So there are some variables that are still correlated, uh, but it's only about 0 0.6, 0 0.65 or something, right? So you have reduced multicollinearity in the data. 
Now, just what I actually forgot to mention, multicollinearity is not necessarily an issue if all you, all you care about is prediction. But it can be an issue if you care about explanation. Right? If you have multicollinearity in your data, then your coefficients are going to be wonky. Right? And it's going to be difficult to explain relative uh, importance of your predictors in the model. So if you do want to eliminate multicollinearity, then you can use PCA, principal component analysis. Right? So um, this is a dimensionality reduction technique. Most of you guys probably heard of it and familiar with it. Um, that emphasizes variation. Um, so if you have 1,000 variables, 1,000 variables, then by doing the principal component analysis, you're going to you're gonna have 1,000 principal components. And then you can look at their eigenvalues and some other stuff that we'll look at on the next slide to decide how many components you want to keep. And by keeping fewer number of components, you may be able to explain most of the variation that exists in your data, right? Now, I don't recommend using this for supervised learning problems, actually, because this method actually only cares about variation. It doesn't care about predictability, right? So you may have your number one component that, has, that explains 25% of the variation in the data, but variation in that direction may not be very useful for whatever you are trying to predict, right? Um, so your principal, so basically the idea is this, right? So if you have thousand, if you were to do supervised learning problem using principal component analysis, then you start with thousand variables, you do your PCA, you retain, let's say, fifty components, and you take those fifty components to build your supervised learning problem, uh, to to build a model, actually, right? Um, but um, I haven't seen this work very well in supervised. In unsupervised learning problem, this can be useful if you are doing clustering or something, and if you have thousands of variables then it's often difficult to find clusters in that high dimensional space. So it may make sense to reduce your dimensionality, do PCA, uh, just focus on top 50 or something, and then do clustering. Um, it's, it's usually relatively easier to find clusters in a smaller dimensional space. So um, in order to decide how many principal components you want to keep, you would look at something called a scree plot and try to find an elbow in the curve, right? So in this case, you may say, you may say that, hey, I want to keep maybe somewhere around 40 to 50 uh, principal components. This one actually only shows the top, top 300, right? There are more actually. But um, so you can make, it's a kind of subjective judgment how many components you want to keep. These are the four things you want to look at, right? Elbow in the curve, what percentage of variance is explained by if you keep 50, then you are going to be able to retain 65% of the variation in the data. So you would lose actually 25% variation, right? So there's some loss there. Um, earlier this year, actually, at ODBC uh, Boston Open Data Science Conference, I, I talked about um, uh, three different ways to detect an elbow automatically, programmatically, from a curve, right? It's visually, it's kind of relatively easy to see where the elbow is. But if you want to do, it, do that automatically, um, you might think of like second different second uh, derivative or something, but it doesn't really work because of the scale. Uh, so there are a couple of techniques, three techniques that I talked about. If anyone is interested, I'll be happy to discuss those later. So in Python, it's really easy, again, to do principal component analysis. I do recommend doing the uh, standardizing your data before you actually do PCA um, because of the to control for the different uh, scale of variables, right? This code just plots the data uh, that we saw on the on the previous slide. Um, so then there's cluster analysis. Now again, this is another technique that most of you are probably familiar with. Um, it's a dimensional reduction technique uh, which emphasizes correlation or similarity. So it's, in a way, conceptually, it's similar to PCA, right? But what it does, uh, now traditionally, cluster analysis is used to group, find groups of records or rows in your data. Right, so if you, have, if you have customer level data set, then you do k-means or something to find groups of customers that are similar to each other, as similar to each other as possible, and as different from the other people as possible. Um, but you can use the same concept for variable clustering as well, to find clusters of columns in your data. Right? So the idea is uh, similar to PCA. You would do variable clustering. You, let's say you have 100 clusters. Then from each cluster, you want to somehow, um, you either either want a representation of each cluster, uh, a, a centroid, for instance, or a weighted average or something, 
uh, or you can pick the best variable from each cluster, the, the variable that represents that cluster best, and take those variables and then build your model, right? Um, so if, in, in scikit-learn, by the way, if you, any of the code, if you don't see import uh, statement, usually most of the stuff is scikit-learn, right? Um, NumPy is NP, Pandas is PD, right? Um, so in this case, uh, feature agglomeration, that's the function um, that, I, that, that can be used to do this. So in this case, I just say 10 clusters, give me 10 clusters, but you can play around with that number and see which one works best um, to give you the best result. And then you transform the data. So in this case, train var class will have 10 uh, columns that you can use for modeling. Um, in, pen, in, 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 in Python, um, the 10 variable, the 10 columns that you have are actually centroids of those clusters, which, uh, which might not be very useful, right? Uh, it's definitely not meaningful because those 10 variables can't be, you can't explain those variables, right? But in SAS, um, any SAS users, by the way? Some of them, okay. I used to use SAS a lot. I still use SAS to some extent. Um, so in SAS, there's a proc Bartlers that actually lets you pick the best variable, the best representative, the variable that best represents that cluster. And you can take those variables and that will be uh, meaningful. You can explain those variables, right? So, so all the techniques that I talked about so far, wherever I say, hey, you can drop those variables, you always want to check the correlation with the target to make sure that you're not dropping something that is useful. Um, but after you have done all those, or some of those six steps, or seven, tests, seven steps, let's say you have now uh, 700 variables out of those you know, 1900 that you started with. So now, as a final thing, what I usually do is I can do one more iteration of um, look at correlation with the target and see if there's some kind of variable. In this case, there's no long tail here, so it doesn't really, it's really hard to draw a line. Um, I mean, you could say that there's an elbow here, but then you would be keeping so few, very few variables, right? But if you see a long tail here, um, then you can eliminate those variables, which are not very correlated with the target. Um, so, um, so the next three techniques are kind of uh, very similar in, in principle, so I combine them together. Um, forward selection, backward selection, and, and stepwise. Um, so the forward selection, the conceptually it's very kind of logical, right? Uh, the idea is to, um, well, one way to do that would be if you have 500 variables, then you would build 500 <laughs> one variable model, right? And you would see which, which model actually is the, is the best. Uh, and then as the best, you might be looking at area under the curve or something else, right? Um, then, then you would want to add another next variable, the second variable that actually improves your performance the most and then you keep, keep adding variables, right? Uh, it can get compu computationally very intensive because the number of permutations are gonna be so high. So one way to kind of avoid that is you already pre-sort the variables by using some, some, some criteria. So in, in um, um, and you can, for example, you can just use correlation with the target, right? The variable that has the highest correlation with the target, that can be your first variable in the model and then you add the second one and third one and so on. And then the idea is to kind of keep adding variables this way and then track how much improvement you get in your area under the curve or whatever metric you are using to evaluate your model. And once you reach a plateau, then you can say that, okay, I want to stop at 10 or 16 or something, right? That's after that, after I have 16 variables in my model, adding the 17th variable is actually marginal. It's, it doesn't really improve the performance of my model. So you can stop there and you can have a 16 variable model. Backward elimination, it's called, in scikit-learn, it's called recursive feature elimination, RFE. Uh, there's a function for that. Um, that just approaches the whole problem from the other end of the spectrum. So if you have 500 variables, uh, you have 10 minutes left of it. Um, then you would start with, you would throw all variables in your model and then you would elimin start eliminating variables that are not, um, not very useful in your model, right? So in scikit-learn, you can actually automatically do that using RFE uh, X, basically. Um, and then stepwise selection actually combines the best of the two, right? So you, you, it, it approaches the problem in a forward direction, but then after some point, after you have, let's say, six variables, 
it's, a, it's gonna evaluate whether, any, whether it makes sense to drop any of the variables that we added earlier, right? So after adding six variables, if the second variable that we added is not doing much, then it will drop it. Um, I think for SAS users, this all will be very familiar, yeah. <laughs> um, so this is how I do that in Python. Uh, so I have a pre-existing, pre-sorted list of variables, and I'm gonna keep adding, I'm gonna add one variable at a time. Um, and then I track the, 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 the ROC, right, after, after I add each variable. Um, I actually am, in this case, I'm actually testing to make sure, because this is a, this is a logistic regression problem, actually. Uh, or this is a log in this case, I use logistic regression. So I'm also checking to make sure that none of the signs are flipped, right? So if a variable has a positive correlation with the target, and if I add, let's say, another variable, and if that flips the sign of the coefficient, then I want to—I don't want to add that variable because it's actually messing up. It's, it's basically happening due to multicollinearity. Um, so we have only ten minutes left, so I'm going to rush through the last two. Uh, Lasso is a really cool technique that was that was very new. Uh, I think it was introduced sometime in the mid '90s uh, from Stanford. Um, it actually kills two birds in one stone, right? So it, it allows you to find the coefficients for your variables, for your predictors in the model, and it also selects the best set of variables, right? So it doesn't have that, for, uh, the previous methods that I talked about, it does have the first mover bias, right? So if you start with one variable, you may end up with a different set of 12 variables that are best, but if you start with maybe the variable that is not the strongest, but second best, you may end up with a better solution. So it has a first mover bias. Uh, Lasso doesn't have that, right? So, so really, it's, it's really kind of logistic regression kind of technique, which uses an absolute uh, error rather than a squared error, right? So you can just change the penalty term. And C is the penalty, um, co penalty parameter that you can actually play around with and find out which one is the best uh, for your data. And then tree-based, um, this is where some of the nonlinearity comes into play, right? So you can use the uh, extra tree classifier in, in uh, scikit-learn to actually build, in this case, 100 different trees on 100 different subsamples. And then, excuse me, if, if a variable, so, so it's gonna build 100 trees, right? And if one variable appears in all of the 100 trees, then that variable is gonna have a higher ranking. It's, it's more important for your data. So, so you're gonna get a, a ranked, ordered uh, list of variables at the end of this, right, that you can use for modeling. Uh, so this is the workflow. Uh, usually, uh, I mean, you can change this and you can, again, improvise and stuff like that. But first I do missing values, then I look at amount of variation. Then you can, for multicollinearity, you can take three different tracks, right, um, depending on whatever you're trying to do. Uh, then finally I look at the correlation with the target, and then um, at the end I may have only 100 or 200 variables that I will use in the core machine learning uh, algorithm. Uh, this is the comparison, really quick. Um, uh, the PCA didn't really do very well, which is not surprising uh, because of the reasons I mentioned earlier. Um, Wartless actually surprisingly did very well. Actually in the top 10 or 15 uh, percentile, it actually outperformed all of the models. But in general, overall logistic regression did the best. So it had a C statistic of 0.72. Now I actually did not participate in this, in this, um, in this competition, so I don't know how I fared according to other participants, but um, this is a pretty good model in my opinion. Uh, decision tree, I was surprised. I'm sure there's a way to improve, um, but I just didn't have time to tinker with um, different, you know, um, different variables and stuff like that. But it is surprising that the decision tree didn't do very well. Uh, and this is the kitchen sink approach, the red line, right, uh, which has 1,900 and some variables. So it did have a C statistic uh, area under the curve of 0.63, which is still better than coin flip, but you can see that it's, it's not doing very well. So since it is almost lunchtime, I wanted to end this with a with picture of food. So big data is really like um, all-you-can-eat buffet, right? You have so many different items that you can choose from. You can go crazy and eat something from everything, right? But a better approach is to watch what you eat, right? If you have calorie, <laughs> if, you have, if you are watching your sugar, your calorie, if you're a vegetarian, unlike me, uh, then you would try to avoid some items, stay away from some items. And that's basically the concept of feature reduction as well. It's, it's about focusing on the variables that are valuable, that are useful, that are meaningful, 
for the problem that you are trying to solve. So that's, uh, that's all I had. Thank you. Um, thank you. So, sorry. So I will take all the questions. Right now, I think we have five, seven minutes five left. Minutes. Five minutes. Uh, outside, I'm available. And afterwards, if you want to reach me on the email or connect me on LinkedIn, uh, feel free to do so. Um, yes, you had a question. Yeah, so the question is in stepwise selection process, right? Why would you, let's say you, 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 you start with the best variable model, you add five more, and then you are adding the sixth variable. And now you may see that the second variable that we added is not, is not very meaningful anymore. Now that, the reason why that would happen is because of multiple linearity, right? Because the, the two steps that I discussed, the bivariate as well as the multiple linearity, that just reduces multiple linearity, but it doesn't eliminate it. So it just, Essentially, it means that the sixth variable that we are trying to add has a is multiple is correlated with the second variable. So after we add the sixth one, the second one is not doing much. So then it's it's a race between sixth and second, right? Which one you want key? Uh, so you could actually look at the coefficient of each of those variables and, and drop the one that is not the p value is not significant, for instance. Okay. Any other questions? Just going back Sorry. Sorry. Just going back to the graph of all the areas under the curve, the RFC curves. Yep. Um, you had logit and then you had lasso. So weren't they both logistic regression? Uh, well, lasso is kind of uh, generalized uh, logistic regression, but it uses a different penalty function. So logistic regression uses a squared error um, as, as a um, regular regular. Yeah. Well, I mean that's just rich if it's square error. Um, but, I mean, I guess, are you saying that the logic stepwise was regularized then? Because I don't think that's necessarily implied. Yeah, so like, logic... If you're doing stepwise selection, I don't think you necessarily have to regularize. Well, it's, 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 so it's about the, I think when you, when you, when you have, I mean, going back to like a traditional linear regression framework, when you're trying, where you're trying to draw a line in your data, right? Um, which, how do you want to draw the line, right, when you have a, so I'm going back to linear regression, right? So the error that is calculated in logistic regression is really squared error, and last one is actually absolute error. Um, the, the number of variables that I have in logic versus lasso are different, actually. Both has a different set of variables, because for logic, I use that whole uh, stepwise selection process, which, which may have a very different set of variables than lasso, right? Lasso is like a, um, the only thing I did with Lasso is try to optimize the penalty, the C, the C value, the penalty variable, right? So, so both are uh, different models. Um, like the, lambda. The lambda, right, okay. right? I guess my point was just you use both of them are logistic regression, right? Um, I think you could I mean, say that Lasso is logistic. logistic yeah. It seems like you're saying like for logistic, it has to be like. L2 regularized. Is that what you're saying? Right. Okay. Right. Yep. That's right. I think there were two other. Uh, yep. Go ahead. So how sensitive is it by the order of the steps? Especially in terms of the logistic regression, because it's like the logistic regression is the order of the steps. Yeah. So in that case, um, what happens if they get switched? Um, what happens if you. Um, I think you can. I mean, they don't necessarily have to be in that order. And as I mentioned, right, whenever, even if you are doing multiple linearity, you are actually always checking the correlation coefficient with the target as well. Because you always want to be, I mean, even if you have thousands of variables, you always want to be careful you don't throw away something um, without checking its correlation with the target. If it does have higher correlation, then you want to keep that. You want to inspect it, and you want to try to find a way to use that model, use that variable in the model, right? But you could argue that, I, hey, I'm, first thing I want to do is I just want to um, check the correlation with the target, and if there is a long tail, you could drop those variables, and then you could do multicollinearity um, and other stuff, right? You, you could definitely do that. It, it, they don't have to necessarily follow that order. 
Out of time. Out of time, okay. Uh, so I think there was another question. I'll, I'll take it outside if you. Yeah. Thank you.